be looking at 2 Kings 4, 1 through 7 today. 2 Kings 4, 1 through 7. And the NIV version says it this way. The wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that he revered the Lord. But now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slaves. Elisha replied to her, how can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? Your servant has nothing there at all, she said, except a small jar of olive oil. Elisha said, go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars and don't ask for just a few. Then go inside and shut the door behind you and your sons and pour the oil into all the jars. And as each is filled, put it to one side. She left him and she shut the door behind her and her sons. They brought the jars to her and she kept pouring. When all the jars were full, she said to her son, bring me another one. But he replied, there is not a jar left. And then the oil stopped flowing. She went and she told the man of God, and he said, go sell the oil and pay your debts. You and your sons can live on what is left. The Lord gave me this this week, and I'm still not exactly sure uh, why in particular, but I feel like in such a time as this, where we're in a season of change and good things are coming, that we need to be in a mindset where we're trusting and we're following him in obedience. And, and knowing that he's going to be faithful. Amen. And so this morning, that's what we're going to talk about. So I first want to look at, you know, what can we learn from this widow? And the first thing that I think that we could learn from her is trust. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 says it this way, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not onto your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Do we believe that? I know I do. I get to see it every day. Pastor Shannon has come with this vision, and we're seeing how God is, is blessing us already. And he's implementing that vision. And as long as we continue to do our part, I believe it's going to be much greater than we could even imagine. This widow, the, she trusted the faith of her husband. And I just had a thought as I'm thinking about that. I find it interesting that the widow, how she introduces herself to Elisha. And she does so first by telling her relationship that her husband had to the prophets. And then she highlights that he was a man of faith. She says, your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that he revered the Lord. And I got to thinking, why would she do that? But here is this woman. And she knew that her husband was a man of faith. So in, I imagine in her mindset, she thought, if my husband was a man of faith, then those people that he was around must have been men of faith also. So that's where she turned. And she found it, Elisha. Men, I wonder for you, in your final days, would your wives say the same things about you? 
about me. My husband was a man of faith. So I know that the church can help me. Second thought that I had was not only did she trust her husband, but she trusted the prophet Elisha. Based on how she's introduced herself already to Elisha, we can assume that this was her first interaction with him. Yet she trusted what he told her to do and that it would ultimately help in her situation. Now here's a mom that is ultimately getting ready to lose two of her children because her debts couldn't be paid. And they had already basically wiped everything out of her home that they could take physically. But it still was not enough. So they were coming to take these two sons so that they could pay back the debt through their physical work. Can you imagine what that would do to a mom? You've lost your husband, and now they're about to take the rest of your family, your own flesh and blood, your, your only two boys. So she was desperate, and she was willing to try almost anything. So when the prophet Elisha told her these things, she didn't even think twice. She just did. The next thing I want to look at here, number two in your outline, of what we could learn would be sacrifice. And sacrifice is defined this way. It's an act of giving up something valued for the sake of something else regarded as more important or worthy. Now here's this widow and she's given basically everything she has left physically. She says, your servant has nothing there at all except for this small jar of olive oil. My question to you today would be, are you willing to give up everything, all that you have left for the Lord? This is something that in our time it is of very little importance. You know, we might use oil to cook with. or uh, I'm sure there's other uses. But in her time, this was pretty valuable. They used it to anoint, and they used it for cooking, and many other uses. And it wasn't just something that you just turn away. But I imagine in her mind, when it was just this small amount that she had left, that it didn't really account for much. You know, I look at this and I, I hear the, her sacrifice and I can't help but think that this is what God did for us. You see, God sent Jesus for us. We all know John 3.16. Why don't you say it with me? It's for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. Giving up something valued for the sake of something else regarded as more important. You see, God gave up Jesus for us because we were that important. Does that not excite you this morning? It gives me chills that my God would think that highly of me and my nothingness. 
that I'm valued that much by my God. Man, y'all are too quiet. <laughs> y'all are scaring me. Let, it, let, let that just sit in a little bit. God loved me that much. He loved you that much. Moving on to number three. Something else we can learn is obedience. Here's this widow and her son. She's followed the instructions that she's been given to a by Elisha. She went in and she closed the door behind her and her sons. I, I want to just stop there for a minute. Why was it such of importance that she go in and close the door behind her? Have you thought about it? This is one of those things that just I, I had to ponder for a little while. But then I thought about it. And I think the reason was because this miracle was supposed to be just for her and her son. They needed to be encouraged and shown. And it wasn't for everybody outside walking in the street. Her faith needed to be lifted up at this point. So she did just that. She closed the door. And what a miracle it was to be able to take some small, what she thought was insignificant, and to continue to pour. And can you imagine just as she poured into each jar and full, like to the point of overflowing? And she's saying to her sons, hey, bring me some more. And the house starts filling up. And they have a hard time walking around. Because see, when God does something, he doesn't do it just this way. He does it this way. We serve a big God. And sometimes we put our God in this little itty bitty box that he was never meant to be placed in. But he's big enough to do much more than I could ever think or imagine. So the room is filling up and she gets to that last one and she fills it all the way to the top and she says, bring me another one. And the son said, that's the last one. And then the oil stopped. What has God asked of you? Has he asked something out of the ordinary? Something out of your comfort zone? Have you been obedient to that? You know, I, I ask that because so many times being in the church, I, I see so many different holes that, that need to be filled. And so many workers so many times the workers are few. Thankfully, in Eastgate, we are definitely better than the norm. Amen. But there's still always room for improvement. Amen. So my question to you is, have you been obedient to that call? You know, I think about when I was called to ministry. I was at Liberty University. I was in my dorm room. And I was going to go into interior design, believe it or not. And, <laughs> yeah, Karen, Karen says she believes me. I, I mainly went into the program because of the ratio of guys to girls was in my favor. Um, <laughs> but uh, oh, I did want to do interior design as well. But God had different plans, and I'm thankful that he did. <laughs> oh, boy. I'll give you that one, Greg. But I remember being in my dorm room, 
and I remember I was preparing for a song that we were going to do with the choir at the Lynchburg Church at the time, and God just entered that room. He said, what are you doing? You know, sometimes when you get that spiritual spanking from the Lord, what are you doing? And I, I knew what he was immediately talking about. I said, Lord, if you'll provide the way, I'll go. And I'm so thankful that he's provided the way. Further than I ever expected. <laughs> it has been some kind of ride. You know, but that, at that point in my life, I, I didn't ever think I would be doing this here. The last thing, if you know me, I'm a quiet person. And the last thing I ever wanted to do was get up in front of a group of people <laughs> and speak. Um, I actually took three different speech classes because I was having such a hard time. I had another elder in the church. I won't tell you his name. Some of you guys I told this story to. But he came to me and he asked me, he said, uh, Pastor, he said, I want to know why are you wanting to be a deacon in the church? I said, well, um, I don't feel like I'm being called to preach. And he, sa <laughs> he said, you don't want to tell people about Jesus? Okay. And uh, the Lord really used this gentleman to encourage me go ahead and, and, and be an elder because he saw something that I didn't. And it's funny how God works that out that way. But I'm thankful that I listen and I'm, I'm humble that I get to do this. Faithfulness, number four. Something that we can learn from this widow is faithfulness. See, God provided all of her needs, and she had extra to live on. Don't you like that word, and? See, he didn't just provide her needs. He provided her needs from now and in the future. Hmm. I, I don't know. We got it. We got to help him out this morning. I'm getting blessed. He provided her needs from now and in the future. He didn't, he didn't just give some small little blessing. Once her need was met, though, here's the thing. She went directly to Elisha and told him. He already knew it was going to be met. But when you get blessed, you got to tell somebody. So she takes off running, and she goes back to Elisha, the prophet, and said, look at what my God did. When God does something in our own lives, is, is that something that we do? Are we that quick to go back and give God praise for what he's done for us? We should. So what can we learn from Elisha. Well, here's the main thing I want you to take from this. We can learn compassion from Elisha. The first thing that he tells her is, how can I help? You see, he didn't know this lady. He knew her husband. He was in the company of her husband, but he didn't know this lady. So you have a lady out of the blue that just comes to you and says, hey, I'm broke. The creditors are coming to my house, and I've got these two kids they're about ready to take. And you stand there. How outrageous is that? And he could have very easily turned this lady away. But instead, he had compassion on her. And he gave her the instructions of what she needed to do. You see, we must change our way of thinking from a self-centered view 
of how does this help me to a more God-centered view of how can I help others. I was thinking about Elisha and this situation, and I think about our situation as a culture where we are right now. And honestly, it scares me from the perspective that the culture is trying to dictate to everybody what group of people matters. Well, it's the Democrats that matter. It's the Republicans that matter. It's the gay rights that matters. It's the blue lives that matter. It's the black lives that matter. It's the, can I just tell you something? Everybody matters to God. And it, it frustrates me to no end because I see things even in our own denomination that continue to separate in certain areas and divide. I'm not going to say why, I'm not going to say who, because that's just not how I am. But can I tell you, I grew up in a home. My dad was white, my mom was black. I got to be a part of both cultures. Neither one is better than the other. Both have their pluses and minuses. What I learned from it is I got to be in the middle. I joke all the time, I, I got to be other. I get to check the box that says other. Because I'm not defined by whether I'm white or whether I'm black. I'm defined by who I am in him. And it's time, it's time as a church that we recognize that. That I'm loved not because of what I am, but because of whose I am. We've got to value the life the same way. And we see others in our culture and they're trying to tell you this and that and the other. And if we're not careful and we're not grounded in his truth, we'll be easily swayed. I'm thankful that my God doesn't have favorites. He sent Jesus for everybody. For everybody. The only difference between us and the rest of the world is we've been given truth and we've accepted that truth. And there's a world that needs to accept that truth. So how does all this apply to me? A few different ways. The first is we have to know the source. Notice I capitalize the source. Because he's the only way. The only truth. The only life. He's the only way. Just as Pastor Shannon said last week. You can claim all these different other faiths, religions, beliefs. But my God is the only one that was raised from the dead. He's the only one that has the power to empower us. He's the only way. Psalm 121 says it this way. I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. He's the maker of heaven and earth. You know, I was thinking there's so many that don't know Christ in a personal way and they walk through life and they have no hope at all. And we have the hope of eternal life through Jesus. We have the answer. We have to share the answer. This is the one time on the test it's okay to give the answer. We need to be telling people about Jesus. Amen. 
Secondly, we must be willing to ask for help. You see, the, the church can't help if we don't know the need. I'm just going to say this, and some people might get upset, but it's okay. I only get to preach one more time, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Please don't go on Facebook and tell all of your your issues that you have. And and then don't call the church and we don't happen to see that Facebook response. And then you want to know why nobody comes to see you. We don't always look at Facebook. If if you have a need, come to and call the church office, call a staff member and let us know. We would love to be there for you. That's what we're here for. That's just my little side note. Don't kick me out. But there's means, there's means through which you can get help for different various things. We've got grow groups and connect groups, and we have CR and a lot of different programs here, and we don't just do them to do programs. We do them to help people. And so there's a lot of hurting people that come in here and they, but they got to be willing to ask for the help. You got to want the help. See, we can get up here each and every week and we can preach to you and you can take it and go home and not hear a word we said. You got to be willing to receive the help. See, in these groups, this is where you build relationships. This is where we learn to take care of each other. You know, I'll, I'll just give you one example. We, we had Angela recently this week, and she got hurt. Well, Angela was a part of our Connect group. So the first thing we did is we got our Connect group together and said, how can we help Angela? How can we be hands and feet to Angela? Why? Because she's part of our group. Now, Angela was loved by a whole lot of different people in the church, so it didn't take long for her to get help from a lot of different groups. But that's just one case. And see, if you're not plugged in anywhere, and you come in and you say, you know, I need some help, but nobody knows who you are because you haven't been a part of anything. You never got involved. You never went to a class. You never connected. Then nobody knows who you are. They, don't, they might want to help, but they don't know you enough to really be helpful. Ask for help. The third way it applies to you is we, we need to show compassion. Just like Elisha did. I wanted to share with you a little bit from Matthew 25, 34 through 40. The king will say to those on his right, come, you are blessed by my father. Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger. You invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick. You looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. And then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry or feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you as a stranger and invite you in or, or need clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison or go to visit you? And the king will say this, truly I'll tell you, whatever you did for the one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, then you did it for me. It's compassion. It's looking out for your fellow man when he needs you the most. And that's what the church is. We're supposed to be that hand to help somebody up when they're having a hard time. And in the good times, we're supposed to celebrate together. This morning, I want to, in closing, I want to have Tim, if you'll come on up. I just want us to reflect on just a few things. First thing I want you to reflect on is this. Am I trusting in God or am I trusting in myself? 
Am I trusting in God or am I trusting myself? Second, have I been obedient to what God has asked of me? And lastly, this, is God asking you to sacrifice something for him? What would he have you do? I don't know how this is spoken to you this morning, but I know that I laid it on my heart. And I know that somebody in here needed this in one way or the other. But I just encourage you to keep moving forward. Because we can trust God. If we'll do our part, be obedient, then he's going to do his part and he's going to be faithful. Because he loves us. He loves us so much that he sent his ultimate price paid for us.